Hello and welcome to this Eden NAP webinar. Uh, thank you for attending. We have a lot of registrants and we are still waiting for everyone to join the room. Um, meanwhile, feel free to introduce yourselves um, in the chat. Maybe tell us where are you where you are from. And uh, yes, we will start soon. So again, very happy to have you all with us. We are going to have a around one hour session uh, about uh, mentors and enablers, and we will have some very interesting presentations uh, from experts in uh, in this topic in, and people with a lot of experience who are willing to share with us uh, their uh, memories and their uh, activities together with the students. I see people are already started starting to uh, write also in the chat. So feel free to uh, tell us where you're from. And also when you have questions for our uh, panelists, feel free to use the Q&A section of the uh, Zoom application. So uh, my name is Vlad Mikhaescu. I uh, uh, am the Eden NAP steering committee chair and I come from the Politecnica University of Timisoara where I uh, do a lot of research and teaching in relation to uh, e-learning, MOOCs, digital technologies, uh, applications of uh, the digital in culture, in entrepreneurship, and several other fields. Today's uh, webinar is a special one because uh, we uh, talk about a topic which is maybe uh, not so discussed uh, in these types uh, of webinars. Uh, and the Eden NAP is very happy to do this. Eden NAP is the uh, Eden's network of academics and professionals and um, uh, fights to have a better collaboration uh, between uh, professionals in our field and also uh, to uh, create some uh, bridges of um, uh, communication between uh, various experts. So today's webinar, as I was saying, um, is um, something different from what we've done until now. And we wanted to see how better, how, how to better uh, help our fellow younger colleagues, the students, and how to uh, better offer them possibilities for mentorship and uh, how to enable them to reach those abilities and those competencies which we uh, uh, seek in them. And for this, uh, as I said, we have, uh, three very good experts in this uh, who are going to share their um, experiences. Uh, I'm happy to see we have uh, participants from Croatia, from Sweden, from the United Kingdom, from Romania and many other countries. And I encourage you uh, again to introduce yourselves in the uh, chat to tell us where you are from. Without uh, making many more introductions, I will introduce uh, our first uh, panelist, our first speaker of the day. Um, the first speaker is Antonella Poche. Uh, she currently holds the role of full professor in experimental pedagogy at the Department of Education and Humanities uh, in the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, where she directs intellect. She is the head of the one-year postgraduate course, Heritage Education and Digital Technologies. Antonella is scientific director of two postgraduate courses annual museum education and biennial advanced studies in museum education at University of Roma Tre. She coordinates national units within European project frameworks and she has been chairing international academic committees dealing with distance learning. She is an author of different publications of national and international relevance on the topics of innovation, assessment and use of technology in teaching and learning in the context of heritage education experiences. And for those of us, for those of us who are familiar with Eden and Eden NAP, uh, we all know, and uh, I hope you also know, that Antonella is a uh, um, very dear member of the NAP community, as where she held the position of steering committee chair uh, until uh, last year. So, Antonella, thank you so much for being back, being back home. <laughs> thank you. In thank the you. Thanks and, to uh, you for, for this opportunity. As I was saying, it's really a pleasure to me to be with you today back back home. As as Vlad said, it's the really the best way to represent this this feeling today. So uh, yes, I'll I'll try to share my screen. Uh, 
in order to uh, start my my presentation that wants to be um, you know uh, a support as as Vlad um, correctly introduced this session today uh, a support to to anyone who is interested uh, in um, helping uh, the students especially in higher education um, in finding uh, the the their their place their um, their um, identity also uh, in uh, connecting to the world uh, of labor um, so the workplace. So we have been working as a group, as, uh, as Vlad mm, told you, I'm now uh, working at the University of Modena and Reggio Emilia, uh, Department of Education and Humanities, but I've been working for almost 20 years uh, at the University of Roma 3, and we have been, of course, uh, cooperating uh, with this new uh, center that I'm chairing at Modena Reggio Emilia, the Intellect Center, which is a center to um, work on the development, the enhancement, uh, especially of cross-sectional skills and critical thinking in particular. Um, in the area of heritage education, but not only, especially in technology um, uh, applied in, in education and so uh, innovative ways of working in, in education in general. Anyway, in this contribution of mine today, the reflection is focused on, on uh, this link between higher education and the workplace. Uh, telling you about a pilot experience that we we carried out um, thanks to the work of uh, other colleagues from the University uh, of Roma 3, Roma 3 University, where I used to be, Maria Rosaria Re, Carlo De Medio, Mara Valente, Alessandra Norgini. I think that those who are familiar with... Uh, with uh, Eden already knows those names who are a part of, uh, of the group and uh, we will work together uh, more and more, uh, hopefully. Anyway, uh, what did we uh, focus on, especially critical thinking um, as a place of linking between the workplace and higher education is it's really um, uh, important to to focus on critical thinking in my view uh, because as many sources say and you can read it here um, it is uh, uh, shared in many many international uh, documents that critical thinking skills are more and more considered pivotal for human and social progress in terms of course of innovation, economic and knowledge growth uh, and so on and so forth. The other aspect uh, related to the importance of critical thinking is that uh, of course being good thinkers, uh, we are also active and autonomous uh, citizens uh, so we really can use our uh, our um, skills and our uh, way of contributing to society. Uh, and this is absolutely important. So as a, a Center for Museum Studies based in Roma 3 University, so uh, let's say last year, to, to be very simple, we, um, we worked on um, a, a different uh, way uh, of um, offering uh, certain, certain modules um, also uh, taking into consideration the need uh, we had uh, at the time to face a dramatic change when COVID-19 uh, firstly appeared and we had to go online from one day to the other. So um, uh, taking this into consideration as a, as a framework, uh, we worked on this uh, pilot experience uh, 
um, trying to uh, enhance uh, certain kind of activities related to analyzing, interpreting, evaluating, and finding solutions through specific work-based uh, activities. For this, for this reason, uh, we involved uh, different stakeholders, um, different partners, uh, in our teaching and learning um, uh, offer uh, that were called to be part of the organization of teaching uh, and learning and that contributed directly with specific activities um, that were designed taking into consideration the need to support critical thinking skills uh, and the need to uh, match also uh, what these kind of partners that were mainly um, companies working in the field of education and heritage education in particular were asked to do. Uh, we worked on different research questions, as you can see here, and uh, so I'll, I'll report about what we found uh, related to these kind of research questions, especially related to um, uh, the uh, stu student critical thinking uh, indicators uh, levels in this kind of teaching and learning activities. So this, the, 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 uh, the trend uh, that we could identify through specific uh, assessment and evaluation tools. Uh, what is this critical thinking uh, level perceived by the students uh, themselves? And which kind of cross other cross-sectional skills were supported uh, through this kind of work-based activities? How the online activities, including, of course, assignments and meetings with uh, these kind of educational professionals, could improve levels of critical thinking skills? Uh, in this, uh, actually, in this contribution, in this pilot uh, activity, uh, participants were about uh, 125, as you can see here, mm, from two different uh, modules, two different uh, uh, courses. Uh, one, as you can see, was one group was just represented by seven students, but the, the other main group was made by 118 students um, uh, from the first year of the course research methodology in education. Which kind of learning activities we worked on we, together with these stakeholders? Uh, problem solving, uh, of course, dissertations, uh, oral dissertation, digital storytelling, analysis, and critical uh, reflection. Um, we had uh, um, actually um, different meetings uh, with different experts, uh, uh, I would say um, experts, but as I said, they were actually stakeholders, um, partners in our um, university activities. Um, and I here, you know, I give you some example, but I don't want to to um, uh, to spend too much time on that. Anyway, um, you can see here the kind of uh, uh, topic and the activity that uh, students were involved in. Um, for instance, uh, uh, building relationship through heritage was uh, uh, an activity where students were asked to uh, work on specific uh, case study analysis, uh, and then they had to report orally about what what they found. Uh, other kind of uh, of activities directly related to critical thinking de development um, can be uh, reported in this one, an inquiry approach to museum education, where students were um, to reflect and work together in groups on um, uh, the inquirement related to the restoration of Palmyra site after uh, the attack. Uh, 
and the analysis of different scientific articles and then report again about their their findings anyway um, i think that it's it's important to focus on what we did collecting uh, data related to the both activities, especially those related to uh, the evaluation phases. As I said, we um, try to work on a different kind of uh, assessment tools. Um, of course, uh, we, we, we worked on critical thinking assessment during the modules, but also uh, at the end of uh, the activities, we ask for um, uh, the, the, the filling in of a questionnaire uh, aimed at assessing their, uh, their uh, um, uh, perception, uh, students' perception of transfers uh, uh, competences uh, acquirement after uh, the activity. Uh, the tools were ex mainly uh, two. Uh, the first one is a critical thinking evaluation rubric that we've been using for for different activities that is of being already tested and validated, and is composed by by six macro indicators. Um, you have here. Uh, um, a picture of uh, the rubric, so basic linguistic skills, justification, argumentation, relevance, importance, critical evaluation, novelty, a series of, uh, uh, of indicators, descriptors, and marks. Um, the second, the second uh, uh, tool instead was uh, another, another um, questionnaire actually this was actually a questionnaire not a rubric and it was um, organized as you can see here on different sections uh, evaluation of the course evaluation of the online meetings with stakeholders and the uh, activity actually and the activity related to these meetings professional skills uh, uh, self-assessment and cross-sectional transverse skills uh, uh, self-assessment through mainly Likert scale uh, options or multiple choice. Um, some data, uh, I'll go very briefly because I don't want to steal time, but anyway, just to tell you that uh, uh, regarding the, the quality of this kind of um, interactive meetings, uh, um, we can say that 56% of the participating students uh, um, considers the activity absolutely uh, good, uh, assigning uh, the maximum score of five to the tools used uh, and also to the organization of the meetings, uh, uh, the videos, the PDFs, the slides, the materials that were given during these activities. Uh, the language uh, used by the stakeholders le slash lectures uh, um, is defined as extremely clear for 45.6% of the students and 22.4% uh, of participants assign a score of five. So um, the, the, the way this kind of, um, of uh, meetings uh, was organized was ab absolutely uh, appreciated, as you can see also from, from this graphic. If we go to self-assessment of the most simulated transversal uh, skills, we see that there's um, a great uh, support uh, related to the idea that through this work, they could develop collaboration, creativity, critical thinking. Um, instead, um, problem solving and innovation were the least selected. And this is something on which we need to, uh, to reflect and to work on. Um, here you have a graphic that mainly uh, reproduces what I said. Uh, and um, um, re regarding critical thinking skills, uh, we can say that there's 
uh, a good improvement. In fact, both the courses and according also to the um, the indexes that that we calculated uh, related to statistics uh, significance of uh, the the um, the valuations, uh, we can say that there's always an improvement from the first to the last activity. And also uh, um, uh, standard deviation is, is supporting. Um, in both, in both the, the groups, uh, of course, one was a very small group, but what is interesting is, of course, the, the larger uh, group where we, uh, we've, whom we work. Uh, together. Um, uh, as you can see here, the distribution of the scores is really encouraging. So, um, to conclude, we can say that this pilot experience, uh, of course, has a, a large room for improvement, but it presents some important indications First of all, for the implementation of a certain kind of uh, uh, online learning uh, paths, uh, what we realized really was that uh, mm, uh, notwithstanding the, um, the difficulty uh, at the very beginning in this kind of adaptation from a mixed uh, blended learning uh, course to uh, uh, actually uh, mainly online course, um, the uh, improvement in, in the quality, but also in the appreciation and in certain uh, important uh, development um, uh, attitudes and skills in, in the students was really uh, relevant and important, especially if we manage in involving those who are um, directly involved in, in the workplace and that should be more and more involved in uh, higher education uh, design uh, for, for um, uh, learning, but for uh, enhancement of quality. Uh, that's my, my main thought regarding these kind of partnerships. And of course, the a, a continuous instructional learning design is, is needed, but in, in this kind of teamwork uh, um, project. So I think I, I, that's all for me now, and I'm here available for any question now or at the end, as you prefer. Thank you so much. Thank you, Antonella. Very interesting presentation and research as always. Um, for me, I think uh, the most intriguing uh, aspect is the fact that for the uh, self-assessment of most stimulated transversal skills, we have uh, collaboration and creativity there in the top, and but then we have uh, innovation uh, at the bottom, which is uh, is yes, I think I think the students don't trust themselves too much. In fact, that's that's my thought. In fact, because uh, actually um, they uh, I mean we don't have time, but but if you're interested, I can send you also some examples of what they produced actually and um, they uh, they were innovative and so because creativity and innovation are very closed uh, but in their self assessment they they couldn't understand how much they were innovative maybe also the concept the idea of innovation is not so clear sometimes Okay, and we have one uh, one question in the chat also, yeah. a very quick question from Uwe Matthias Richter. Was there a research question looking at the link between learning on the course and the workplace, applying learning to practice and critical thinking? So let me get that. Um, looking at... Can you can you repeat that, so, uh, Vlad? From Uwe Matthias Richter. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Was there a research question looking at the link between learning on the course and uh, the workplace. 
uh, applying learning to practice and critical thinking. No, actually, uh, but that's a very good suggestion. Where and uh, we'll, as I said, we, that was a, a start, uh, but we we really need to improve uh, our our ways of uh, also assessing uh, of self assessing uh, by the students um, their work. So we'll we'll introduce that because of course. Um, it, Many, many um, issues were in a way implied, but not so open. So that's, that's a, a, a very interesting point. Thank you. Thank you, Antonella. Uh, we will see if maybe participants have more questions uh, after we finish with all the Absolutely, yes, 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 yes. And I encourage attendees to uh, write their questions in the Q&A section and also um, People who are watching on YouTube, you can write in the chat and uh, we will uh, answer here live. We move now to the uh, second uh, speaker of the day, second panelist, and uh, it is a great honor for me to introduce for the first time uh, in an uh, Eden uh, webinar, uh, Julia Gonzalez Ferreras, uh, who was awarded the Bo Gregerson Award in 2011 for elaborating, designing and coordinating the innovative project Tuning Educational Structures in the World, together with Robert Wagener. Based on close cooperation of hundreds of academics from Europe and around the world, Tuning has contributed to the modernization of higher education by developing an approach for designing and implementing curricula using the student-centered approach and the concept of key competencies and learning outcomes as focal points. As I said, a great honor, Julia. Please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, it is a pleasure to be with you. Uh, it's my first time here in Eden. Uh, even though I know about it, you are too famous to, to be ignored. So um, anyhow, what I have done in this case is um, a reflection on mentoring and the importance of that with in relation to the students. So I, if I will share um, my presentation, I think somebody was asking for a full... Yeah, um, thank you. A full screen. We'll get, okay. So, um, what I'm going to, to talk about is um, a reflection that brought us to to prepare something on Caloge, which is a new project on um, actually assessment of competences with the students. But that, uh, what I wanted to say today is something about what we have learned um, in relation to mentoring during this last period, um, what may be implicit but do not always happen in, in learner center activities, then competence-based learning, a reflection on the critical, a critical dimension, and then some good practices. I think that one of the things that we have learned during this pandemia time is that um, distant learning um, has wonderful opportunities and also the beauty of linking both um, distant learning with the presence of the professor, with the, the presence of the mentor. Um, here in Eden, you have been pioneers of quality and I think it is very important to keep this this idea in mind in relation to, to the future. The Import, importance of presence and proximity, and I know that that can happen very often also through a distant learning encounter. But the importance of following the student, this is the mentoring, this old tool that touches the, the essence of learning. Um, I was considering how important it is for us as teachers and how sometimes we get a little bit carried away. Um, this is something that happens to me. And I was reflecting and I want to share with you my reflections. Um, in the learner center learning, <laughs> um, I think it is very important the awareness of the capacities of the students. 
And the only way of really getting to know the capacities is by the close, the close proximity, the intense interaction with them. Um, whichever format, uh, it is the only way I think that we can we have of knowing the style of learning. Because I take mentoring in the you know in the straightforward sense. Um, the mentoring is really knowing their capacities, their style of learning, their difficulties, their strengths, and to be able to have to offer some kind of contrast in the process. Well, in the title, the idea was to help the students to get the, the, the competences and the competence based knowing the objective. I wonder how much, how often the students are really knowing the target of where they are going. Um, this is a reflection that I often do in the projects I am running with at the moment. I'm running in several of them. And it is very important to be able to, to discover whether they have understood where we are going, because the mentoring could start really from knowing the objective, knowing where we, we go. The second, the other aspect would be facilitating the road and walking together with them. Um, and I think that going back to this competence-based situation or learning that we do, I think that all these issues would be very, very important related to working with them, to be able to understand where they are and so on. Now, in the project we are doing, um, in order to, I mean, Alfredo is there too, um, in other fields, but we are doing teacher training, education, and looking at the different dimensions that we imagine, that we feel that it is important for the teacher, we came across and we emphasize very strongly the dimension of learner empowerment, potential and creativity. Um, the previous speaker, Antonella, was talking about the strength in, in the thinking, well, the critical thinking, which we are all fascinated and see the importance. And also, when we think about the types of uh, particular types of thinking, Creative thinking um, is related, is another aspect in a way of um, critical thinking. Um, there again, we've, we were discussing of the strength of the creating and focalizing in the empowerment of the learner. Um, we are developing a number of indicators for um, this, this um, a sketch, which would be obviously with knowledge, skills, and wider competences, situations. Um, we, we find actually that um, the whole issue of wider competences sometimes is better to start with in order to go back and think what kind of knowledge do they, do they need for that. But um, supporting the learner the holistic growth and development um, is something that in our capacity as mentors, as facilitators, is very important to, to develop. There, um, the second, okay, another element that we were discovering and discussing is learner self-esteem and confidence. Um, I am now working with the students who are at the university um, and also we are developing non-formal learning for those students. And the capacity or the, the, the moment that they lose their esteem and conf confidence is really uh, an important element of breaking the whole system of their capacity obtaining, gaining capacity in that. Um, 
Of course, the learner motivation and resilience, this is another element that we have found that would be very relevant to, to see what type of knowledge, what type of skills would be um, supporting this learning. And finally, obviously, the, the whole aspect of tutoring, how we, how we carry out the tutoring and how they, as teachers, are able to, to follow that with, um, with the students. Um, the whole reflection on the impact or the importance of how we develop this capacity, um, both as university teachers and student or professionals um, developing um, student teachers and people who will be future teachers of education would be very relevant. Um, I was just thinking of good practices that um, I think we, we, we have to emphasize um, in the issue of giving feedback to people, knowing exactly how many times we actually do this practice um, and participate in the, in the development of encouraging the essence of the things that are beginning to appear in their work or making them feel where they have actually uh, gone uh, on a different track. Um, another very good practice is the whole issue of partnership with them, with the students, developing um, this situation where we work together with them. Um, I wanted to comment something about ACE, uh, which I think is a very interesting project out of the ones we are doing, um, which is incorporating students in um, learning center uh, in, 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 the, in the students, uh, aprendizaje centrado en el estudiante. Um, there, a whole revolution is taking place in, in the universities which are participating in Latin America because in the project, something that was very revolutionary at the commission would hardly allow us to do, which is incorporating students into the whole process of development of learning. Um, what I hear, the reports that I hear is that the universities are completely mobilized by the fact of having a partnership between students and professors learning how to teach or learning how to give a better um, presentation or a better um, uh, track to get the competence. Um, another aspect that I wanted to mention in terms of good practices is learners as mentors and enablers. I think there again, um, the capacity for a student and peer learning um, is a good practice that uh, is extremely relevant. I'm sure that you all practice it, but I think it's worth mentioning and worth, worth reflecting as something to be, not to forget it, to be incorporated. And obviously, inter-teacher mentorship, which is in a way what um, I could see that um, you develop. Then reflector, reflecting or in conclusion, um, I was just thinking, um, looking back on my personal life, and in fact, it is the first time that I talk about it, um, thinking of my personal experience, I have never had more tutors in my life that I had when I, when I was writing my PhD at, at Oxford University. Um, I had a moral tutor. I had a supervisor. I had a team group of co colleagues. Um, there was a very strong, and the undergraduates also had a very high level of tutorship. And what I learned from that period and I carry it through my life, is that um, the capacity to make 
the other person feel that their ideas are important, that what the, that they are uh, that the capacity to create, to innovate, to think out of the box is important, um, and perhaps it, it is a an atmosphere, or it was an atmosphere, in which made everyone there felt um, very much um, encouraged to, to feel that things were possible. Now, sometimes um, in some of the systems that I have been looking at um, before and after it, I see that um, the mentorship to the students um, is rather rushed, is not given enough time, potential. Um, and I just wanted to, to kind of bring to, to the colleagues here this concern, because I believe that this, um, this capacity or this tool um, is very relevant, both in terms of um, competence-based -learn learning and in um, a student or learner-centered learning, and also in the whole process of growth um, of our people. Now, after the pandemic, I think that probably we will revise our practices and the time given to different um, different tools, different practices. And I thought I was very interested in this mentorship uh, facilitation that was put in front of me by, um, by Alfredo and say, well, think about it. And I was um, interested to, to develop, to, to encourage and, and to have the, the feeling that there is a, a very strong element there in the empowerment of our youth that can, should, must be done um, through our mentoring practices and through our mentoring capacity, because their empowerment um, is very much the future and uh, their empowerment really can bring them to fulfill the profiles that we wanted to have, the, the needs of society, uh, you know, looking at their uh, training and development from whichever angle. Thank you very much. And um, I just want to offer to you this reflection. Um, and if there is any, any comment, I would be pleased to, to listen to it or to, to answer. Thank you. Thank you so much, Julia, for this uh, very warm presentation and for sharing uh, your experience and also um, these personal memories which you shared with us. Um, I think Alfredo wants to ask a question or... No, okay, I, I saw you unmuted. Uh, I, have, uh, I have one question for you. Uh, you mentioned uh, as a good practice, feedback. And uh, we know uh, good feedback is easy to be given and therefore we forget it many times with uh, our students we are mentoring. Um, but I was wondering if you can just share your approach on how to best give uh, the bad feedback when um, uh, students fail to accomplish uh, the objectives we set for them and how is uh, best to do that um, in order for them to still be motivated to continue the work. Well, this is an excellent question because it is a hard one. But um, uh, sometimes uh, they can come to that conclusion themselves when you are reflecting and um, they can almost show the road of what where they are and how much uh, they, they actually have thought about what they have done or what they have presented. I think that there are ways in which um, if you know, you know, they are again, if you know that the, the track they are going, if they know they are where they are, their learning style, it would be very important to show them, for example, what they have done 
I mean, there may be cases in which they haven't done anything and there is nothing you can show. Okay, so <laughs> this, I think, it would be much more if you know them on the potential that they have, that they could reach, but they, they haven't reached. Or if, um, you know, if they have done a huge effort, maybe the emphasis would be much more on the effort and how far they have got, but there is still a little bit to go of, of the road. I think that there is always, um, you have mentioned um, the word um, being motivated. And I think that the being motivated is a very important element that must be kept. And I think that, you know, saying um, this is as far as we have got, Perhaps you can emphasize either the effort or what little is is uh, still to be done, uh, how far you, the potential that this person can have. You know, there are certain elements that, that can be brought um, in the counterbalance of obviously mentioning and telling him or her very clearly what should be done and perhaps which route should be taken in order to get there. But thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. Thank you. Thank you. And that was a very interesting answer and uh, a good approach. And I encourage uh, our colleagues who are attending to, to try to follow that, uh, that advice you gave. Um, if uh, any other participants want to ask questions to Julia or to Antonella or to Alfredo, please feel free to do so in the chat or in the Q&A section. We will still have time to answer some question uh, at uh, the end of the session. Uh, I move now to the next speaker, and um, this is a good colleague of mine from the Eden NAP uh, steering committee, also an Eden executive committee member and an Eden senior fellow, Alfredo Soiro from the University of Porto, Portugal. Uh, Alfredo holds a degree in civil engineering from the University of Porto, a PhD from the University of Florida. He was pro-rector of the University of Porto for continuing education. Uh, he was a founding member of EUSEN, European University C Network, uh, RECLA and AOPEC, uh, many organizations uh, related to uh, education and um, universities. His positions held were the Vice Presidency of EUSEN, Vice Presidency of CEFI, President of uh, IACEE, and many others. His main interests are engineering education, continuing education, and online learning, focusing on networking, international cooperation, and student evaluation. Without further ado, Alfredo, please uh, share your experience with us. Yes, I'll try. Thank you very much for the kind words. I, I'm a little bit uh, concerned that I may, may be uh, somehow duplicating uh, the presentation of some of, um, of uh, uh, the topics I'm, I'm presenting. Because, in fact, um, uh, I'll take the, um, uh, this last remark from, from um, trying to put it, uh, sorry. To stop, I don't know how to get out from here. So I'll stop sharing go, go. and keep talking. No, that's okay. So okay. I'll keep talking and then uh, going back to, to where I was. Um, but um, the point is that uh, the motivation is very important, especially when we're talking about assessment, which is, uh, as you know, uh, a very important uh, perspective of the student's uh, position in terms of, um, of uh, making uh, their own, um, come on, I cannot uh, see, Wait, one moment, okay, Try. okay, uh, yeah. I think I'm doing it now. Yes, no, it's... <laughs> sorry, sorry for the delay. Um, and uh, this question of motivation is related with the assessment and uh, something that uh, worries very much, but goes in line with what uh, with what Antonella said and uh, her case study and with uh, this question of mentoring and uh, tutoring students. Um, and uh, what I'm presenting, for those who know me, I, I like to present things where I've been involved. So that's what I'll do. I'll present four case studies. Um, I'll start uh, from the, 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 let's say, the, the, the last one, 
which is um, in this case um, in this case is a project um, that it's called the Digital Immigrant Survival Kit. Um, it is a project uh, where we uh, we have 15 modules to help uh, people that are not uh, uh, comfortable with the digital uh, tools and the digital transformation of the, of the, the, the communication and the other aspects of life. And these 15 modules are all online. And uh, one of the things that was um, agreed by the partners was to have this uh, mandala, let's say this uh, uh, way of uh, somehow um, understanding uh, their own skills. So we have several degrees of, um, of domain of the skills we are handling it. And we are using this um, uh, mandala before the, the, each participant uh, uses uh, each one of the modules and afterwards. So we, we have a perception, not only we, those that are uh, somehow mentoring the courses that are being handled by the learners, but especially each one of the learners that is using this, it's where they are and where they feel they have progressed after attending the module. We are going to present this, um, this project in the synergy session of the next Eden conference in Madrid on the 22 to 25 of June this month. It's virtual, and uh, maybe uh, you, you can attend and know a little bit more about this experience. So this is something that it's uh, trying to help uh, each learner uh, to conduct uh, their own efforts to uh, acquire some competences in certain areas that are defined in these 15 modules. Now, a second case um, is uh, the tuning experience. We did it with uh, Asia. And um, it is uh, this uh, tuning with Asia, it's, it was, it ended. Uh, it's, we're going to have a second edition, and Julia probably knows more about this than me. But uh, what happened was that uh, uh, I was uh, working on the civil engineering program, and they invited me to attend uh, a two day seminar in the, the, the university in Malaysia, in University Sains in Penang, um, and um, it was uh, interesting because it's a um, school where the programs are already based on outcomes-based education. So um, here is a list of the program outcomes for civil engineers. I don't think you are interested in knowing in detail uh, what they mean, etc. but they have it. And I'm, the approach they have for other courses is the same. But what is, is interesting, and that's what I wanted to show you, is this. They have a platform that it's called, called Cobis. Um, and um, this platform um, analyzes the progression of each student towards this program outcomes. Here is a sample. Uh, it was uh, sent by my colleague, Professor Ahmad. Um, and, but, but here is a sample of um, a student that has uh, uh, let's say, placed in the middle of the population, apparently, according to the GPA. Uh, and you, you see the progression and uh, the intended, uh, let's say, program outcomes, attainments, and um, uh, their overview of the situation and a definition in which program outcomes they probably need to uh, intervene. So th that's why this question of mentoring and enabling um, is very important in terms of um, making them happy. I, I, I always remember a situation where uh, at least they know where they are for. They, they have the program outcomes and they know uh, for which reason they are studying. And um, this is interesting because they follow each student uh, regularly, I think at every week, I don't remember, but they follow and they control their progress to the program outcomes. Here is uh, something that I wanted to show you that uh, in this uh, picture on the left, the majority are women. I don't know if this is a consequence, but I don't think so. It's, a, it's, a, it's an approach of the, of, the, of the 
the school. And I'm very surprised to see so many women involved uh, in engineering education, in education, in this case, in engineering education. Uh, the third case, and I'm speaking quickly uh, because I'm just presenting the case studies that you may, may, may would like to, to, to study later, is this one that it's uh, on a vocational education and training school. I'm a, an expert uh, in Portugal. Uh, the ECAVET. ECAVET is European Quality Assurance, Educational Education and Training. So, and, uh, they, and they have audits to have the label of ECAVET. And I, this is from one of the, of the, the schools that I visit. And, and as you can see, they also have the same approach. Um, they have um, a platform where they uh, analyze the behavior of each uh, of their students. And um, there's one within, uh, there are more, uh, let's say, screens and more perspectives on this uh, platform, but this is uh, the usual. And it's interesting that they have this um, uh, denomination uh, for uh, monitoring the progress of, um, of the schools in Portuguese. What you have in the title is from met uh, the methodology from dating to marriage. And marriage means to motivate the students to get involved in what they are learning and what and with the school and with the teachers, etc. It's a very interesting process uh, on a vocational, like I said, on a vet school. But the higher education can learn a lot from, from this approach. They have here different uh, perspectives uh, from evaluation to uh, the chronogram of the activities. They're, again, they're... Uh, intended learning outcomes and competences and reports from the teachers. They, it's a very interesting school because they have um, uh, two, two, uh, two psychologists with the, with the school to also help um, uh, the progress of their students. Um, and also here again, there's the platform that is called Dating, where they monitor the progress of each student um, not only towards the program outcomes, but uh, basically with their behavior, their participation, their involvement, their relationship with the other. It's a very, um, how do I say, very detailed, um, um, uh, how do I say, intervention in the progress of the learning for, for each one of the students. With the, this uh, intervention from, from, from all of those involved when necessary and properly to try to make them the, the, the learning uh, much um, smoother and effective. Um, another, and this is the last case study, this is where I'm involved. This is one that I've been working the last years, uh, which is the use of e-portfolios, where I, I use this with the students from the last year, graduating students. So they are adults, they have between 21 and 23 years old. But um, I, I think that uh, it can be used in other uh, levels. And um, uh, what it's done here with the e-portfolios is that they know for each uh, one of the working weeks what are the intended learning outcomes. And uh, they make a weekly report on the portfolio with what they think they acquire. But what happens, and this again is, goes in line with what Antonella and uh, Julia said, that goes with the individual discussion with me for each student. Each one of them talks with me when they are there. Sometimes they are not, so they, I'll talk in the following week. But talking about what they reported, their difficulties, what uh, uh, have they learned, what uh, is recommended, what they uh, didn't like, or not didn't like, what they didn't understand well, and how I can help them uh achieve the intended learning outcomes of course with the pandemic in this last year it, some of these discussions are virtual personally except the body bodily language of the students i i think uh, this communication could uh, was done virtually and it worked well but it's always better to have a face-to-face -face. there's this look in the eyes of each other and uh, like I said, the bodily language, which sometimes speak more than, than many words. And like I said, this is the, the idea uh, that it's uh, behind this 
uh, mentoring or tutoring and formative assessment that it's done. And um, just a last uh, slide, um, which goes in line with, uh, with that when I was said and I and Julia, the, that uh, assessment in English comes from the Latin verb acidere, which means to sit with. And I think that we are uh, using a lot of assessment modes that uh, don't uh, provide um, possibilities for this mentoring and tutoring and adapting to, to each learner. So this question of sitting uh, with a learner is something that um, is something that we have to consider, to, like it's mentioned here by the, 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 the quote that I placed here. Um, and uh, we have to sit with the student and learn what they think, what the, what's happening, uh, how can we help them, and, um, and uh, not, uh, how do I say, treat them as numbers. I had here another quote from a PhD student of mine, that uh, did the PhD precisely on assessment of students. And um, she once turned to me and said, well, you know, a student is a person, not a number. I don't know why she told me that, but uh, it's right. Uh, and we have to treat them as persons and uh, we have to sit with them. So this question of uh, mentoring and enabling, I think it, uh, it's only possible uh, with the individual uh, sitting. With, with each one of the learners. I don't think one size fits all, which is a danger of the online uh, teaching right now. Uh, we, 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 we consider, more. Well, some of us consider that uh, uh, one size fits all and one format will work for everyone. So this is it. Um, and um, i am stopped sharing my, my screen. So if um, there are Thank questions. You. Thank you, Alfredo. This was very interesting, uh, especially since uh, we saw an approach uh, in another part of the world, so uh, with the specific application uh, to Asia, so we can make may maybe some uh, comparisons in our heads. Uh, there is a technical question for you in the Q&A, and I will kindly ask you to uh, uh, answer that in uh, typing about uh, uh, data and platforms. But I have one question for you because you mentioned um, about the individual discussions with students and also uh, I agree that the students uh, are persons, not numbers. I uh, try to, to, to do what the, the, the exact thing that you suggest. However, I am wondering uh, what would be the best solution for scaling and if scaling can be done because we have colleagues who, who have uh, 100, 150, 200 students how can they manage to mentor everyone with this uh, individual approach? Let's put it this way. Um, I don't have a, an answer uh, that it's uh, black and white. What I'm thinking is that uh, when you deal with students, uh, you have many students, you also have probably many teachers and many hours in your uh, let's say, in your working schedule. So it's, it's really a question of planning your time. I have about uh, between 40 and 50 students, 50 students, uh, and I can talk with them every week because I just, um, um, how do I say, just um, uh, use the time of the classes. Uh, we have a system in Portugal that it's not very common around the world. But we, I use the practical uh, schedules to talk with them. And uh, when we were having the pandemic, we would schedule, you know, at this time it's this one and that one. You more probably, but I think the results are more rewarding. If you have a, a hundred students, I don't know, it depends on the, the internal regulations, but that is generally proportional to the, the work schedule. So the hours you are assigned to teach and um, you just have to do it uh, in accordance with your logistics and your regulations. But I think it can be done. Or if it cannot be done, at least you should try. If you don't uh, meet with them every week, then meet uh, every two weeks. I don't know. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'll type the answer. The, the question is interesting on the question. And answer. 
what data do they use in the COPS platform to monitor progress? What I was told, as I observed, is that they make um, uh, regular examinations from the classes and the homeworks and the quizzes, and that's how they verify the progression in terms of, uh, of the program outcomes. And they, they have an office that it's um, uh, only dedicated to assessment. For instance, uh, no professor can uh, deliver an exam without the overview of this office that is in charge of uh, verifying if the exam is uh, properly uh, done and uh, according to uh, the policy or strategy of evaluating the, the program outcomes. Thank you, Alfredo, for answering both questions. Sure. Now we have, uh, we still have some time to to have a group uh, discussion. I, I think Antonella raised her hand. Uh, I think yeah. you want to answer yeah. on the scaling question. Yeah, <laughs> you read my mind. <laughs> yes, yes because I wanted to to add something to what Alfredo said. Um, actually, um, in, in my experience, we, uh, especially in Italian universities, we normally have very large classes. And during this last uh, uh, lockdown, I, I had the opportunity to work with very large classes. And also the report that I presented is related to some of the classes we had last year with, with large, large um, classes. Uh, what I found out is that if you manage in um, do project work with the students, organizing them in different groups, there's also a peer-to-peer -peer mentoring system that, that comes in. And motivation is really supported. And actually, especially this last term, Many students told me that um, not having the opportunity to go to the university and meet other people, especially first years of, uh, of uh, the courses, um, through this kind of online working in groups, they had the opportunity to meet other students, to, to exchange ideas, to create, uh, you know, um, groups that were able also to cooperate on other, other subjects. I uh, think that is not so easy, even when you go face, when you go face to face. Because sometimes you, you in large classes especially, uh, even if you, see, you sit close to someone and maybe you have some words with, with someone close to you, but then that's it. Uh, instead, working together in groups online really help them. And actually, they use different kinds of channels. They use, the, um, of course, the um, uh, teams, uh, that was the, the platform given by, by the university, but they also cooperated through different channels. So, so they met with, uh, with WhatsApp or other, other kind of uh, um, interactive tools. So it's possible, yes. Thank you, Antonella. <laughs> I, I loved most the idea of uh, peer, peer yeah. mentoring. That I think that's a great. Uh, and um, I, I also saw that sometimes uh, this works uh, in a miraculous way. From yeah, exactly. sometimes from people you don't expect, but uh, they they step up and yeah. Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. That's that's true. We we have some more questions, and um, um, I would like first to to read the, the question from Diana Andone. Uh, is there a good approach to blend professional and personal mentoring? How personal can you get as a mentor with your students? And I saw that Antonella already uh, answered this. Uh, I would ask uh, Julia if uh, you want to uh, also answer this. So how personal can we get as mentors with our students? Um, well, this is very, it's very difficult to draw a line, but I think that uh, we have a task with them, which is to bring them to a particular um, profile, to a particular personal development. And I think that there is a task. And um, going beyond that, unless they, they, they come along with, with a question or a comment, I don't think we should we should interfere in their in their lives. However, I think that it is important to know the difficulties they go through or the 
the, the situations where they where they can be which can be making it difficult. I, I was very interested with this comment uh, um, by both um, Alfredo, whom I think is a, has a great capacity to come closer to the students. I must admit that he has a capacity to design because I think there is a lot of um, creativity in the way we design the lessons or the classes in such a way that, uh, for example, Anto Antonella was talking about group mentoring in a way they are mentoring each other and they come up, in my experience, they come up much more uh, prepared to, to be mentored at, at the level of the teacher because there are different levels. If they have been discussing each other and filling up as far as they could go together, then they come up with questions and they, they will be much more open to see further st stages in, the, in their progress and ask the, the tutor for that. But uh, in relation to, to the question, I think that it is a very delicate line and it, it's only knowing, you know, I mean, we have a task, we have a, um, of bringing them, developing them as, as people, um, and particularly in the sense of um, their capacity to reach what we promise at the level of university. And, that is uh, our task. And I think that the respect and, and engagement with them has their two sides of the same, of the same line. But um, I can imagine this, this setting of diverse class and groups very often. I have done lots of groups during the classroom, short explanation and groups. And that, as Antonella says, is a very good moment to find uh, where they are or how they go. Thank you for this. Uh, indeed, it's a very delicate question. I thank uh, Diana for, for this question. And uh, I think uh, the answer will differ from uh, culture to culture. Uh, politically correctness is different understood in uh, various cultures. And uh, this is a challenge indeed. Um, Alfredo, would you also like to answer this question about the uh, blending professional and personal approaches? Uh, microphone, please, Alfredo. Let me put it this way. I, I, I try to be uh, less personal as possible. I, I, I think that um, uh, I'm, I'm, because um, we, we all have different lives. We all have different personalities. And um, I'm, 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 I'm an engineer, so I'm sorry. Uh, so we, I, I want to have this problem solved of the competences, et cetera. And um, so I, I concentrate on that. that. That's my approach. But sometimes, of course, I was dean of studies and, uh, uh, and I had to deal with personal situations and I did my best. But uh, when doing the teetering and the mentoring, I try to concentrate on the personal, not on the personal, but on the professional. Uh, and like Julia said, it's a very thin line. So I, my mind is always on trying to get away of the personal because I, I, let me tell you a story. I, I, I started as I think everyone here started. We started teaching at no training. And we just uh, applied for being a teacher at university or uh, sometimes even without doing the PhD. And we started learning uh, without a net. And uh, when I started, I had a professor and she was um, uh, very competent as a teacher, etc. But when we were giving grades uh, and we did it all in a group and I was the youngest one, um, she always said, oh, this uh, boy, oh, he's so kind, he's so educated. We cannot give him that great, you know. And th these things are, how do I say, uh, mark me a lot because uh, we, we were giving grades not in, as a function of the person, but a what of a function of the outcome. So, and, and, uh, and it was um, um, an approach that some, some teachers still have, I, I have, old students of mine that when they are teachers, they have this personal approach, but, it, but it's not fair because uh, I, I know that each one of the students is a person. 
that's that's okay. But as as a teacher, when we are evaluating, and that's what I talked about, we have to, we should concentrate on the outputs and on the on the outcome. So that 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 is my recommendation. But that that if I can say just a word, uh, it's sure. a way. That's why yeah, we are here. It, it's a way uh, to. Um, I mean to to honor and respect the student first of all, and our roles as uh, as teachers, as you said, Alfredo, especially in in the southern European or uh, area, um, we we are not uh, trained, uh, especially to to be good assessors, and and this is uh, an issue actually. Uh, we should really work on that with the young generations because that that is uh, essential. Uh, and so doing, we also teach our students how to um, to consider that uh, the more the the objective uh, ass the assessment and the better for them. For them and for their their, their lives. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. I, I think also Julia um, wanted to to jump in if I saw correctly. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, just a very quick comment because I was thinking. I mean, I'm very happy with um, with both Antonella and um, and Alfredo's comment because I think that we have to have a guiding line of where we are and what is our purpose there. But uh, no, I just wanted to comment that in terms of um, this following up the students, there is a moment which I think it is particularly relevant, which is first year. First year students. I think that we, uh, we didn't mention it. And I think I wanted to make just a little gap saying that um, we are doing some research on first year performances. And sometimes it's just lack of specific competences on this on, on the on the part of the students or the professors that actually end up with great failures and people who could have who could do very very well never get to that because some there is a mismatch there in terms of competences like time management and issues that are completely you know sort of ways of studies methodology that they, they, they jump from a particular system to another. And then there, I think, uh, I feel that we should be more trained, and particularly the teachers who are in first year should be much more prepared to, to take these elements, which are, which are really how to, uh, how, to, how to perform better what their time, what, what to do. Uh, best in the, the use of the time, the way of approaching things, the you know the whole system that that they need to to somehow sit with them. Uh, I like your uh, yeah. sitting with them mm -hmm. the, the story because it is there that we can lose them, and it is a, re a real pity. Yeah, I, I will be even bolder and say why why stop at first years? Why don't don't we go to secondary education and start from there? Yeah. Yes. Sure, sure, sure. We can go that that far, and we can continue because there is another moment that um, Antonella was somehow touching, which is when they leave university, and you know, sort of that kind of um, how best they 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 can use their their training in, into uh, their their professional life. So there are moments I think that even though they may be throughout, but there are moments in which they the mentoring or the following up or the sitting up with them um, is particularly particularly relevant. Thank you. Uh, I, I, I think, uh, uh, thank you all for the, for the patience. I know uh, we are a little bit late, but I saw that there were several questions on the same topic and uh, I would like uh, to have a, a short answer in a few words from all, all three of you. So the question is related of how can we motivate uh, students now in the digital uh, environment and in the online course? How can we make them uh, pay attention and be motivated uh, to sit through our courses? I don't know what's the case uh, for the three of you, but uh, our students 
we we try to to uh, beg them to open their camera so they we we, we teach uh, dark screens and uh, maybe some of them open their cameras but it's very challenging we even if it's interactive and they they sometimes start their microphones you don't know exactly what they are doing so this is my question to you in a very good a very short example what would you do best for them to be motivated and uh, uh, in this online environment you we start in whichever order you you want I can start if you want, but just to tell you about, you know, my experience. Um, I've seen that, of course, involvement is the first key word. So you need to, um, to um, maybe, and actually that's what I did uh, for all this last term. Give them some materials in advance, ask them to work, uh, with specific questions on the on the materials you you give, uh, and then ask them to present uh, their work during the the, um, the online uh, meeting, the lecturing. But uh, you need to, and this is uh, um, strictly connected, closely connected to assessment because they are motivated and involved and participate. If you reward them some way, um, uh, marking their work and keeping that, that, that production, that mark um, for their final um final mark uh, this uh, proved to be uh, actually essential even if it's a small part of of the whole grade that they will get in the end but they feel really motivated and they really participate and actually i can tell you that during this last term they really were mm, um, I was impressed actually because um, with large classes, with different groups involved, uh, anyway, they they all wanted to reach the end and to be productive. So that's my my view. But I want to steal more time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Antonella. Julia. Yeah, I can follow because it follows very closely. I was just thinking which are the activities that are more exciting and where I get, we have got more uh, motivation and, and uh, participation. And it is when you divide it into teams and they have to present the, their results, and particularly when there are questions which are being asked from, from, from a team to another one, when they are subjected to a situation where, because otherwise they just present the thing this is how our experience, and you run the risk that they, they, they disappear. Yeah. But if they, have, if they have another element afterwards of actually having to answer a question about something that somebody else has presented, then they have to listen <laughs> to listen to what is going on with the other people. I mean, let us be fair, they are interested in what other people are doing. But sometimes it grows more, you know, the interest grows highest if there is a further element that they have to ask each other and then they have some kind of uh, being exposed to what the other people have said and they have to answer it in a different way and they have a recession period where they discuss it Absolutely. you know bringing another kind of elements because then then they are more prepared and again jointly engaged i think that the word engaged is very very clear yeah 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 Thank you. Thank you, Julia. Alfredo? Yeah, that's the multi-million dollar question. <laughs> it's not <laughs> easy to engage because my, my, my notion after all these years is that if a student doesn't want to learn, he will never learn. It doesn't matter what we do. You can jump or you can, you can sing, you can do whatever you <laughs> want. If he doesn't want to learn, he will never learn. But, but let me give you an example that I do with my students. Um, uh, it's on construction management. And um, the tactics, uh, for instance, for certain subjects, it doesn't work with all of them. For certain subjects, it's a question of role-playing. 
Um, so some of them are, you know, construction owners, some others are the construction workers, some others are the construction engineers, and I put them a, a problem. And they, they decide what to do with the discussions among them. And um, it's interesting because when you give them time to prepare for this discussion, sometimes you really have uh, very good, um, let's say, solutions from each one of them. So that's what I, 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 I do. It's role playing, uh, but with a concrete problem. Thank you, Alfredo. Thank you all for, for uh, very interesting answers and uh, for very good examples. Uh, I hope and I believe that uh, we managed, you managed to inspire our colleagues attending today to uh, be better in mentoring uh, their uh, students and also to mentor, to, to do the peer mentoring between each other, not only to let the students do that. Uh, thank you again for all of you for attending and thank you to our three great speakers for uh, accepting to present today and for sharing your experiences. Thanks to you, really. Thanks. Thank you. It Have was a pleasure. Evening. Yeah. And thank yeah. you, Julie, for showing up at the Eden <laughs> event. So pleased to meet you, Julia. So pleased yeah. to meet we hope, you all. We hope to see yeah. you at other events for Eden yeah. as well. Let, let me tell you something. In person, she's much more... Uh, funnier and interesting than uh, on a virtual. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope we can start to meet again face to face. Uh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Like, that would be the point. Thank yeah. you. Thank okay. you. Bye bye. Bye, -bye. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. And bye. Bye.